social order was among the statues given by God Almighty to the house of Israel under the leadership of Moses. When you harvest your crops, don't reap the corners of your fields and don't pick up the stray grains of wheat from the ground. It is the same with your grape crops. Don't strip every last piece of fruit from the vines. And don't pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and those traveling through. For I am Jehovah your God. You find that in Leviticus 19 verse 9 and 10. It would seem that people who own agricultural fields would have workers reaping the crops when it was time to do so. In the fields there were reapers and gleaners. This was the way of life at that time. And so we have the story of a young woman, Ruth. Not from the house of Israel, but a stranger, an emigrant coming to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, whose name was Naomi. Ruth was a poor Moabite woman and decided to look for employment in the field. The subject of this message is the gleaner. Our reading will be Ruth 2, 1 to 10. Our text is Finding Grace. Ruth chapter 2, verses 18 to 17. We have a few ish points we want to talk about. The first is the gleaner, a physical application. Now, Naomi had an in-law there in Bethlehem who was a very wealthy man. His name was Boaz. One day, Ruth said to Naomi, Perhaps I can go out into the field of some kind man to glean the free grain behind the reapers. And Naomi says, All right, dear daughter, Go ahead. Ruth found herself in a situation that demanded her to make a decision to help herself and probably her mother-in-law, Naomi. Life is always placing us in situations that call us to decide what course of action we should take. Sometimes it's not an easy judgment call, and it can lead to an unwelcome outcome. Ruth made a calculated decision, and it turned out to be the right one. The question we ask ourselves, was it a hard decision? We don't know, but the result turned out to be the right one. We are instructed by the manual, the word of our creator, to come to him in prayer and seek his guidance in making decisions of the heart in whatever situation we face. We do not always follow the instruction and we find later that we did not make the correct decision. The scripture says that David prayed seven times a day. I do not think he got down on a mat, knelt down and prayed, but he did find a place and a moment to talk to the Almighty. God always promised that he will hear us wherever we are in audible prayer or silent prayer. For he knows the heart of man. He wants us to come to him 
and seek his guidance and his comfort. Psalm 119, verse 164 to 168. Seven times a day I praised you because of your righteous judgments. Great peace have they and those who love your law, and nothing calls them to stumble. Lord, I hope for your salvation, and I do your commandments. My soul keep your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies for all my ways are before you. Now this is the consolation we have when we seek the direction of our Heavenly Father in confronting many circumstances of life. Ruth then left and went and glean the field after the reapers. As it happened, the field where she found herself belonged to Boaz, the relative of Naomi's husband. The question is, do you really think that when things happen to you, it is always of your own making? We have to remember constantly that we are not our own. We belong to the creator of this universe. We have entrusted our lives in his hands. We know that the road to the kingdom has many hills and valleys. And it must be our confidence in God Almighty to see us through. Ruth did not know that she would find herself in this part of the field and that she would gain the attention of the owner. First, she got the attention of the foreman, the one in charge of the workers, and then the curiosity of the boss who owned the field. When you are on the job, you do not always know who is watching you. You don't always know what they are thinking about you. You do not always know how they feel about you. The foreman was watching Ruth and he was able to tell Boaz, the owner, how she was doing and also or her approach to the job. We are on the job of preaching the gospel of the kingdom and supporting those in positions of responsibility. We are being watched by God Almighty, our Father in heaven, but we are also being watched by those around us. A very encouraging report was given about Ruth and her work ethic. Our spiritual application as well as our practical application must reflect who we are and our commitment to the goal of achieving eternal life through our spiritual work ethic. There is one very important aspect of our spiritual work ethic and it is essential to our survival in this Christian battle. Paul speaking to young Timothy on the subject, diligent workmen give this instruction. 2 Timothy 2 verses 14 to 19. Remind them of these things. Charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers, but be diligent to present yourself approve of God. 
a worker who does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the work of truth but shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase to more ungodliness and their message will spread like a cancer Herminius and Felicius are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some nevertheless the solid foundation of God stands having this seal the Lord know those that are his and let everyone who named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Apostle Paul also speaking to the church of Corinth on the subject of the resurrection offered this great insight. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 58. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not always sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Then he says this, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, Ruth chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Now Boaz arrived from the city while Ruth was in the field. After an exchange and greetings with the reapers, he said to the foreman, Hey, who is that girl over there? And the foreman replied, Is that girl from the land of Moab who came back with Naomi? She asked me this morning if she could pick up the grain droppings by the reapers. And she has been at it ever since, except for a few moments rest over there in the shade. I don't know about you, but I've always admired staff members being diligent about what they were doing in the performance of their duties. I wore two hats at the UN during my last 12 years of service. One was an assistant supervisor and the other one was a liaison officer for the diplomatic pouch at JFK. As the assistant supervisor, I would be on the floor helping the staff prepare the diplomatic pouch bags for shipment, and I could see those who totally engaged with what they were doing, and I became more involved because of their attitude. Their performance encouraged my support, even to the point of working overtime. It also meant buying boxes of pizza depending on the number of staff on duty. They all got energized even to the point of giving more of themselves 
to the assignments. My evaluation was given when the reporting time was scheduled. Our Heavenly Father evaluation of our performance is coming and we want it to be on the right side of success. I asked a question. What do we want to hear? The answer to the question is found in the parable Jesus gave his 12 of the 12 talents. Reading from the Living Bible, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. He said, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going to another country who called together his servants and loaned them money to invest for him while he was gone. He gave 5,000 to one, 2,000 to another, and 1,000 to the last dividing it in proportions of their abilities and then left on the trip. The man who received the 5,000 began immediately to buy and sell with it and soon earn 5,000 more. Yes, the man with the 2,000 went right to work and earn another 2,000. But the man who had received just one dug a hole in the ground, hid the money for safekeeping. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to him to account for his money. The man who, to whom he had entrusted 5,000 brought him 10,000. His master praised him for the good work. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, he told him. So now I will give you more responsibilities. Being the joyful task I have assigned to you. Next came the man who had received 2,000. With his report, sir, you gave me 2,000 to use and I have doubled it. Good work, his master said. You are a good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over this small amount, so now I'll give you much more. And the man with the 1,000 came and said, sir, I knew you were a hard man, and I was afraid you would rob me of what I earned. So I hid your money in the earth, and here it is. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. Since you knew I would demand your profit, you should at least put my money into the bank so I could have some interest take the money from this man and give it to the man with 10,000. For the man who use well what he is given shall be given more and he shall have abundance. But from the man who is unfaithful even what little responsibility he has it shall be taken from him and throw the useless servant out in the darkness. There shall be weeping and gashing of teeth. When God our Father grants us his favor in the things we do and the way we live our life, it is an absolute pleasure and a great feeling. Do we not promote ourselves or we do not promote ourselves but we try to be faithful and mindful of his attention toward us and so we have the next set of surprises in the life of Ruth 
finding grace, finding favor, a spiritual application. Ruth 2, verse 18 to 17. Now, Boaz went over and talked to her. Listen, my child, he said to her, stay right here with us to glean. Don't think of going to any other fields. Stay right behind my women workers. I have warned the young men not to bother you. When you are thirsty, go and help yourself to the water. It was seen from the instruction of safety that women could be an easy target for injury or bad conduct by others in the field. The protection of women in those days was not what we have in our world today. And so Boaz showed his concern by giving her those instructions of being careful. What was it about Ruth that caused Boaz, the boss, to pay such attention? We have already read of her work ethic. And where she came from, she was a Moabite. Who was a Moabite? So who were the Moabites? Where did they come from? We have a little historical information that gives us some insight. The Moabites were of Semitic stock and of kin to the Hebrews as indicated by their descent from Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and by their language, which is practically the same as Hebrews. This is clear from the inscription on the Moabite stone, a monument of Mesha, king of Moab, erected about 80, 850 B.C., and discovered among the ruins of Dibon of 1868. It contains 34 lines of about nine words each, written in the time of the Phoenicians and the Hebrew characters, corresponding to Salom, inscription on those found in Phoenicia, showing that it is a dialect of the Semitic town prevailing in Palestine. The original inhabitants of Moab were the Imams, a great, a people great and tall of the Elkins. When these were disposed of by Moabites, we do not know. The latter are not mentioned in the Tel Am Aram letters and do not appear on the Egyptian monuments before the 14th century, when they seem to refer to under the name of Rutan and Lutan, i.e. Lot. Muab appears in the list of names on a monument of Ramsey III, the 20th dynasty. The country lay outside the lines of march of the Hebrew armies, and this accounts for the silence of its monuments in this regard. End of quote. Now let us continue with Ruth's situation. Ruth 2, chapter 2, verse 10. Now Ruth thanked Boab warmly. She says, how can you be so kind to me? She asks, you must know that I am only a stranger, a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied. And I also know about all the love and kindness you have shown your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and mother in your own land and have come here 
to live among strangers. Many of us can identify with, or many people can identify with Ruth as a stranger in the land of Bethlehem. Many of us, or many people coming from different lands in the Caribbean, where we were born and come into the United States of America looking for a better life and finding the blessings from our Heavenly Father. I like to think that all of us at some point in our employment receive a level of attention because of our performance which gain us promotion or change of position. Now, I will confess, that is what happened to me. And all I could say was the hand of God Almighty and his favor to me. There is another critical aspect to the life of Ruth. The love and kindness that she displayed toward her mother-in-law seemed to go a long way in Boaz's thinking and his evaluation of her. We are called upon to show these same qualities in our training and development as children of God. An important observation. Ruth, as an immigrant, was not taken advantage of and was not abused by her boss, but was given respect. The disrespect and abuse and abuse of immigrants that we see today, as we watch the news from around the planet Earth, is an outrage an outrageous state of affairs. From God's perspective, how should you treat immigrants or foreigners that seek to improve their standard of life? God Almighty is watching and he gave the nation of Israel instructions as to what was pleasing to him. Many times, if those instructions were followed, we would see a difference in the attitude of those who display anger and hate against immigrants. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33. Here's what God Almighty says. Do not take advantage of foreigners in your land. Do not wrong them. They must be treated like any other citizen. Love them as yourself. For remember that you two were foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am Jehovah your God. And then we have this. Deuteronomy 15.5. Sorry, 15.7. He says... If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of your gates or in your land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and diligently lend him sufficient for his needs, whatever he needs. Boaz continued with his words of support, encouragement, and a wish of blessing for Ruth. Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. He said, May the Lord repair your work, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. It is great when you are seen as someone who put their heart, meaning their intellect and emotion, 
into what they are doing. And it is recognized to the point that you become a subject of praise and blessing. When this happens, one becomes motivated to do even more than the assignment. But then, there is the desire to respond to words of appreciation for the recognition of your work ethic and talent. How would you evaluate Ruth's response to Boaz's commendation? Ruth chapter 2, verse 13. Then she says, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. I call this reply words of appreciation and wisdom. In Galatians, we find words of admonition. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sow, that shall he also reap. Now, I inject this scripture to show that when you do something of value, it will come back to you and if you do something evil, it will come back to you. Boaz commended Ruth for showing kindness to her mother-in-law. And now he is doing the same thing to her. Finding favor with your fellow man is a great thing. But finding favor or kindness with God is always a humbling experience. God Almighty will show his favor to you when he determines that your actions are acceptable to him. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept back some. This is what I call finding favor. Some of us have experienced this kind of attention in the workplace or even in some other situations. Getting special attention from your supervisors and their consideration of you just because you display your characteristics of good conduct and a respectable attitude. When management observe your ability to perform, they look for opportunities to invite you to lunch or other special events just to show their interest in you. Many times we call that a blessing and yet we have to be careful, observant, and wise in our decision to say yes to that invitation. What do we do when we are confronted with these kind of opportunities? We search our hearts and seek direction from our Heavenly Father through prayer for his confirmation and his leading. As I said before, I found myself in this same position and my decision was to go to Almighty in prayer. As his children, he promised to hear and answer our requests and seeking answers in our situations, we often look to the scripture for direction that would give us encouragement. I wholly embrace the idea that the Bible is our survival kit. And you have heard me use it before. 
the writer of the book of Hebrews give us this instruction Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 and this is so very important in the situations that surround us that we are confronted with he says for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was all but always in all points he was tempted yet without sin let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need Psalm 17 verse 6 I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show me your marvelous kindness by your right hand. O oh, you have saved those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Who are we going to trust if we cannot trust the God of this universe? Our Heavenly Father and Yeshua Jesus the Christ. How much do we trust our family members? We know that there are some dysfunctional family members or families, and we have seen them recorded in Scripture, and therefore this is nothing new. Yet, on a normal scale, we do have respect for our families and we do trust and love them when we talk about becoming a member of the God family that is a goal that goes beyond anything you can wish for there are things that we desire to have in this life and yet there are second to achieving the goal of family membership with God Almighty. Do we have the trust in Jesus Christ, our big brother, and his example to get us there? I talk about trust because even in the workplace, our aspirations must fit into God's plan for our lives. We do not conduct ourselves according to the lifestyle of society. Finding favor with God is of great importance to our success in life. Continue with Rome, Ruth in chapter 2 verse 15 to 17. And when she went back to work again, speaking of Ruth, was told the young man to let her glean right along the sheaves without stopping her and to snap off some heads of barley and drop them on purpose for her to glean and do not make any remarks <laughs> don't just leave her alone so she worked there all day and in the evening when she had beaten out the barley, she had gleaned, it came to two bushels. At the end of the day, when you are satisfied that you have done your best, you have that feeling that our Heavenly Father is pleased with your performance. What then should be our response. It is to give him the honor, thanks and praise for his kindness to you. The Almighty works in ways that we do not always understand, but we follow his leading and that is always the best. When you are given instruction in a workplace from your boss and you know that it is out of the ordinary what do you do 
I would think that the opposition to the directive could come in your mind. Yet, you comply with the directive. Do you think this time of this type of situation existed in the work environment at this time? In today's workplace, with all the different kinds of issues, there would be many problems that would arise. You could have the situation of gender equality or salary disputes or racial preferences or any kind of concern that may develop because of the instruction given to the reapers. When God Almighty grants you his favor, sometimes those around you will respond in negative actions and others will have a positive response of congratulation. How do you confront the negative action? Here again, we must consider that we are in training for a higher standard of life and a different lifestyle completely. We must encourage each other in the truth that life for us has a different meaning from the society around us. It's different. That's why we are here today. It's totally different. They have no clue of what we are talking about. They think you're crazy. It's okay. I don't mind that. But the end result is glorious. Yes. Now we have a great example in the story of Joseph in Egypt. It is an overview. Quote. In Egypt, Joseph became a slave to an official name, Potiphar, and quickly rose to be head servant of the household. After Potiphar's wife lied about him, Joseph lands in prison where he once again rise to be the warden's trusted assistant. Joseph interpret dreams of prisoners which eventually led him to interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh to prepare for an outcome or oncoming famine. Pharaoh placed Joseph in charge of all of Egypt at every step. Even away from his family, Joseph gave glory to God and acted with integrity. In Egypt, Joseph was sold as a slave to Potiphar, captain of Pharaoh's God. God blessed Joseph in the work he did. After a time, Potiphar trusted Joseph so much that he placed him in charge of everything he had. Joseph was well built and handsome. Potiphar's wife tried to tempt him, but he refused to sin. Who would have known if Joseph would have disobeyed God? His family was not around, and he might never see them again. The fact that Joseph chose to do the right thing, even when no one else was around, to see him show that he had personal integrity, he did the right thing because he truly was a righteous person. Eventually, Potiphar's wife tricked him and accused him. Potiphar was angry over this, but he put Joseph in prison rather than executing him. Execution would have been the normal punishment for this sin he was falsely accused of committing. Sold into slavery by his brothers and thrown into prison for a crime he didn't commit, 
Joseph could have given up on God. But even in prison, he remained faithful. God bless Joseph in prison. Soon the warden put him in charge of everything done there. Joseph was about 17 years old when he was sold into slavery. 17. And apparently was put in prison soon after that. He was 30 years old when he was released from prison. So he had been in prison close to 13 years. Usually the unusual that the cup bearer, the baker, and Pharaoh all seem obsessed with their dreams. Dreams they were given great importance in those days. Pharaoh's advisors even had manuals to help them interpret dreams. Pharaoh's advisors, again with these manuals. Note that Joseph didn't use a manual. He depended on God to provide the interpretation. It was bowl of Joseph to suggest a plan for dealing with the famine. But God must have been on, at work because Pharaoh was impressed. Pharaoh showed Joseph or showered him with gifts and honor including Pharaoh's signet ring, robes and fine linen, a gold chain necklace, a chariot to ride, a new name and a wife. Joseph's time in Egypt was filled with events that were extremely bad and extremely good. In whatever situation Joseph found himself, he gave glory to God, worked hard, and kept his personal integrity. Finally, the question is, what should we glean from Joseph's conduct and integrity? Let us be mindful of the grace and favor of God Almighty that has been extended to us as children of the light and be faithful with the responsibilities given to us or desire to hear these great and wonderful words from our Heavenly Father. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in the joy of thy Lord.